Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Pacific Partnerships in Education here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Joining me in the Think Tech studio today is uh, Shanti Asher. Welcome, Shanti. Thank you. And we're going to be talking about some uh, issues in education near and dear to Shanti's heart. This is uh, really sort of a follow-up show to what we did uh, two weeks ago. I had Dr. Jojo Peter on, a, a regular guest on the show. Uh, and we were talking about the issues around Chuuk moves or the discussions about Chuuk separating from FSM. And he, Jojo brought up a lot of very complex legal issues that this has on, on what status would this leave people who are Chuuk citizens in the US, blah, blah, blah. What does this do to the Compact of Free Association? And it occurred to me that because you are a recent graduate of Thomas Jefferson Law School, I believe, in San Diego. Uh, and so this would be great to talk about the, some digging a little more deeply into the legal issues here. But let me, let me just say, uh, uh, you are, uh, what, what inspired you to become an attorney here? Well, so it's always been uh, childhood dreams, you know, oh. like you always get up in first grade or fifth grade and you say what you answer, what you wanted to be when you grow mm -hmm. up. So that was always a, a dream of mine. But then as I, you know, um, as I started to grow up, I noticed that it's actually something very difficult financially, mm -hmm. uh, given that uh, we're from the islands and there's not really a lot of resources. But um, when I pursued my uh, post, when I went to Shamanad, I'm actually a Shamanad uh, alum. Excellent. I went there for, I left right after I graduated from high school and pursued um, my secondary education there with, um, with my first, I, I guess for that was my foundation to, you know, go towards that goal. And so I graduated with my BA in uh, pre-law. Huh. And then uh, I got married after that, stayed, uh, st remained here in Hawaii. And then uh, about two, three years later, I went uh, for my master's in huh. criminal justice. Huh administration so I got that but the reason why I was tell I'm telling you all this is when um, while I still kept that in the back of my head that I still wanted to mm -hmm. go to law school um, living here in Hawaii I started noticing that I have to go back and give back because I was on scholarship when I was here so my family and I moved back home and I think it was really um, the core, it was really what inspired me to not give up and come back uh, and pursue law school. Um, when I think Jojo, Dr. Um, Peters, he was talking about it uh, in your last segments, but uh, it's, I, being in FSM, I saw the, the great need for local um, attorneys because mm -hmm. most of our um, legal advices or opinions are provided by uh, people that you know uh, came and worked in the FSM, mostly foreigners. And while we really appreciated the work that they provide for us, there's always that uh, gap of you know growing up and understanding our cultural differences and in applying that when you provide legal opinions. So um, I watched that, I observed it, and. I cannot stand idle and not do something about it. So it really, when I was there, seeing all this happening, unfolding, I, it took me about four years to be in the process of, you know, applying to law school or even taking the law school admission test. So it was, I think it was, it started as a childhood dream and then later on it became, uh, I became really motivated to do it for my people because who's going to better assist than um, someone who is a sister, a daughter of the country, so yeah. Exactly, and, and the, the issues there are very complex because there was essentially the, the Chukis people who were living there had, a, had dealt with ways of organizing disputes yeah. and settling disputes and, and laws and nature, but they, it was not written down, right? Yes. 
And yes. then they've had a legal system sort of imposed on them that, as you point out, was sort of written rather haphazardly, right, by two or three or four mm -hmm. sort of random judges who happened to be there. Yes, who yes. sort of helped craft a, a constitution, the constitution and laws. But it's not really well backed up by case law and precedent and all that kind of stuff, right? Yes. So what, what, are the, what are the big challenges facing, uh, facing people now? There are so many. Um, <laughs> you know, a few of them. <laughs> yes. Uh, since we are a developing country, mm -hmm. there are a lot of pressing issues right now. Um, with the Chuk secession, that's another thing uh, in, uh, on the plates of a lot of the officials back home. Uh, then there is, there is that issue, the cross-cutting issue of climate change, which is uh, becoming um, it's, it has gotten to international stage, and um, like we always say that our islands are sinking. It's actually not sinking, the water is right. rising. So um, that is one. I think some of the legal issues too are a lot, now that we've became, we've become parties to a lot of international conventions, so our compliance and obligations are also pressing because uh, a lot of these matters deal with human rights. Human rights issues, we have uh, gender equality, and being parties to these conventions actually requires us to be in compliance. So, and then we have the compact, mm -hmm. you know, nearing the economics, uh, the economic sector of the compact is nearing in 2023. Uh, but with all of this in place, I think, uh, now that I'm, hopefully I will go back and work in the legal, um, in our legal system, I believe that being, and we're still in our infant stage of, you know, growing and developing, mm -hmm. most of the need is really, personally, uh, it is within uh, what we're facing now and how we are going to deal with it with the laws that we have. And there's a lot of things that I believe, comparing to the, Constitution of the U.S., what they, the codes, the statutes, there are a lot of components that are missing. Mm -hmm. And now that this session is um, now on the table, it goes back to, does the Constitution allow for that? But that's for the legal teams of FSM to address. Mm -hmm. But with uh, reading the Constitution and all the uh, gray areas, there's a lot of gray areas right mm -hmm. now. It's very difficult, it's very complex. Right. So uh, those are some of the legal uh, matters that I believe, while there are a lot, mm -hmm. I think those are uh, what I think may be um, on the table right now, uh, mostly compact, climate mm -hmm. change, human rights. So yeah, those are. And the other one that sometimes pops up in, in our education world is the, the issue, at least in Chuk, of land ownership, right? That, that yes. There was traditional divisions and traditional land ownership, which got all disrupted during the Japanese occupation. Yes. And now it's a little unclear as to who owns what lands, and so yes. you can't get clear title to lands, and that makes building new schools very difficult. And yeah, that's. <laughs> uh, I think land ownership and rights is has always been an issue, uh, given you know uh, who has legal title, and because I think traditionally families know who who has rights in something, but then if the laws uh, jump in and try to dictate or interpret differently, then there's always problems. Sure. And I think it's not only, it's not specific to Chuk alone, all the other islands have that issue. And like those are the gaps that I was addressing earlier in our legal system are those that I guess there has to be precedents that are now being set eventually when cases are being brought to, you know, uh, to the courts. Right. It's a, it's a very complex system, as you say, across the FSM, because you have, in most of these places, traditional governance, uh, traditional sort of clan-based leadership, right? Certain yes. clans owned or had rights mm -hmm. to certain parts of the land and could more or less control that land and control the use of that land. And then... Yeah. Over the, overlaid upon top of this now is a sort of are these Western style governments that aren't always lined up with that, right? This, the same traditional leaders are not always in charge of the governmental set, sector, and the governmental people aren't always the traditional leaders, and mm -hmm. therefore there, there are these sometimes uh, 
sectors working at odds. Yeah, they overlap, they clash. Uh. Um, but I think that's one of the one of the things that has to be dealt with, as far as like when we were flagging that it's really important and vital for locals to pursue legal education so that when they go back, it's really easy for them to apply it when they try to maybe amend the laws, what's mm -hmm. already in place. Uh, because they're, when they were, when they were drafted way, way back, right. uh, all these issues are just emerging. So mm -hmm. there's, it's just like any constitution, uh, any legal system, there are amendments that are done. And um, like for land, when you raise that one, there's also that issue with dual citizenship because there are some questions that are being challenged with uh, the system, whether, because FSM citizens cannot have dual citizenship, there are kids that are born into a family in the U.S., and then with that, they're being stripped of title because they can't be, they can't be U.S. citizen, they have to choose. Uh -huh. So we're, there, there are not only complexities with those living there, there are also emerging issues as to kids that are born in the U.S. who are natural by birth, they mm -hmm. are U.S. citizens, mm -hmm. but then when they go back to their homes, do the lands transfer over to them or not? Right. So right. It's, it's all those other right. matters. All, all this just really screams out that you, you I, mean, I sort of hate to say this, but, but you really need more attorneys, right? Yes. And, and you need, what you need is yeah, uh, native Chukis, Pompeian, Koshrayan, Yapis, yeah, attorneys. Yes. You need people who understand, who grew up there, who know what the customs are, know what the traditions are, and can help bring some of these aspects into the 21st century in line with a, a, a good, robust legal yes, framework, yes. right? Well, I think with all this, uh, with all these going uh, going on, there's always, you have to strike a balance. Right. Yeah, so that, you know, um, we don't lose our customs, we don't lose our traditions, while we try to move forward with also ensuring that we have compliance, you know? Right. So, sure, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a, <laughs> You know, like it or not, we're all we are all living in the 21st century, right? Yes. And you may wish to make an option for Chukis or VIP citizens to per, pursue very traditional means of livelihood, that, and that's wonderful to maintain a culture mm -hmm. and a tradition. But at the same time, yes, as you say, your uh, FSM is party to international agreements and conventions and signatory yes. to, to international treaties and all, and has to sort of stay on top of that. Has to be doing what needs to be done there. Uh, and you're not immune from the no. issues and challenges, right? I mean, the whole thing with the South China Sea these days, right? Yeah. And China trying to assert their more dominance in that, in that region. Uh, that impacts shipping, it impacts trade, it impacts economies, right? Uh, and, and so, yeah, how, uh, how FSM deals with China is a whole I'm sure there's a whole raft of legal issues yes. in that. <laughs> and of course, that's complicated because the U.S. doubtless has their, uh, what should we say, their desires on how FSM should deal with China, right? <laughs> yeah, with our special relationship right. with the U.S., there are provisions that we also need to comply with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, it's in a lot of different areas, and with us touching on trade, trade falls right into one of the brackets that has to be complied with. Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, th this is great. And we're going we're gonna to dig more deeply into this when we come back. Uh, Shanti Asher is here, a, a new, newly minted legal mind. <laughs> uh, and I'm Ethan Allen, your host of Pacific Partnerships in Education. And we'll be back after a brief break. See you. Hello, and welcome to Out of the Comfort Zone. I am your villainous host, R.B. Kelly. Today we are playing two truths and a lie, and I will tell you two truths, and you will tell me which one is the lie. Truth number one, this is a real mustache. Truth number two, I want you to watch my show on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. So tune in and let me know which is the truth and which is the lie. I'm R.B. Kelly with Out of the Comfort Zone, and show up next Tuesday to see my mustache live. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea 
is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. And welcome back to Pacific Partnerships in Education. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today here in the Think Tech studios is Shanti Asher. Welcome again, Shanti. We were having in the, in the first half of the show a, a great dialogue about some of the issues with uh, legal, uh, the need for more legal talent in uh, Micronesia uh, because of the complex situations and all. But I, I want to step back because uh, when we started, we talked a little bit about how you got interested in the law and have pursued a, a legal uh, degree and legal career. But doubtless, pretty coming from a small island state, uh, you've had extra challenges in, in, in pursuing that, that dream. Yeah. And, and can you maybe elaborate on that a little bit here? Yes, of course. So, um, I, being that I'm from Kuchai or DFSM, there are challenges as to, especially for, for uh, women or girls to go further into pursuing their education. And um, I remember when I was almost graduating from high school and sharing my aspirations about leaving the island to pursue my education. It's, it's always been a sensitive issue, you know, yeah. whether my parents will let me go, uh, is it safe, and you know, because we're from smaller islands. But uh, I have to say that I really commend my parents because they, it was really, I think the first resource that I had through them was the um, having trust in me that I can go and continue fighting for what I wanted in my life. And that was really, they opened that door. And for a lot of other students, I felt that there is always that um, resistance. There's uh, parents are not, it's not easy for them to let go. Right. For girls, especially. Right, there are very strong family ties, and we, in, I know from working at Prell, that are, we've had very promising students who were sort of offered further education here in Hawaii or in Guam or in the mainland, who basically said, oh, "I can't do it. You know, I have to stay home and take care of my nieces and nephews." Yes. You know, yes. and it's a, it's a strong family obligation. A very strong sense of community there. Uh, it, it's it, it, indeed your parents are to be commended for having encouraged you and supported you in, in, in doing that, so that's... Yeah, and it was more challenging because I'm the oldest of seven. Oh, so uh, yeah. it, it is uh, whether to let me go for pursue my education or stay back and help them. Right. But because they saw the potential and I've had scholarships that were offered, they couldn't, um, they will be at peace if they let me pursue my dreams. And that's exactly what I did. Um, but when, um, fast forward, <laughs> when I wanted to pursue my, um, go back to law school, I tr started um, searching for uh, options. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really the resources that were made available or lack of availability that I felt was another challenge. Um, also, it's, I think now that we've evolved into gender equality, there's more. It's more of um, a topic that's not so much sensitive anymore to in today's um, mm -hmm. society. I felt that I had to pull in um, extra work just to prove that I'm able, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, at the work that I was uh, working for uh, foreign affairs, I, it was a really great opportunity. While it was challenging, given that I, at the, at the time, the position I had was only, uh, it was a deputy assistant secretary, and I over, oversee the Pacific uh, region. Mm -hmm. So most matters that are Pacific related comes through my desk, to my desk. And um, I think, like, trying to prove, my, prove others of my capabilities was one challenge. And then when I moved over to uh, look into law schools, I realized that the resources that we have available for students who wanted 
to pursue that um, avenue is very, maybe it's there, but the data is not available, mm -hmm. readily available. So I had to, while I was not the first FSM uh, student that graduated from U.S. law schools, there were a number before me, mm -hmm. good number, uh, um, a few. <laughs> the information was not available. Huh. And I'm not really sure if it's just because of um, the lack of ensuring that we collect those data and put mm -hmm. it into one place. It's, it, I realized that that's been an issue across the board. Sure. It's just data management, collection of data. And I think that if we have more of that, it will probably make it easier for other students. Right. If you, yeah. If, indeed, if you, if you had known half a dozen other students who were a few years ahead of you, mm -hmm. who could have helped answer questions yes. or reassure you that when things get tough and you can push on through, you can, you, you can do this, right? That would have been yes. very helpful. And yes, it, it seems like somebody somewhere ought to be gathering that data, making sure that any aspiring students have this list of here are contacts, here's where they currently are, here's the post they currently hold, go talk to them, you know, see what yeah. kind of support they can offer. Um, that would just seem a very part and parcel of, of a good bootstrapping because, so how many, I mean, how many Coach Ryan attorneys are there on the ballpark? Uh, as far as I know, um, I believe there's there are two really? from law, uh, U.S. law schools. Okay. Um, as you may be aware, there are a, a good number of FSM students that pursued their legal interests, but through USP. Okay. So they went to Vanuatu to pursue their um, oh. legal studies. Okay. The reason why I chose to continue on with U.S. schools is because of my background is mostly U.S. and because our constitution is is very is mirroring the U.S. constitution, so it makes sense to go to a system, an institution that will discuss very relatable concepts to our constitution. Absolutely, and that's why I pursued uh, law schools in the U.S. But. As for other um, attorneys that are from Kushai, I think there are other, uh, um, maybe a few, that graduated from Vanuatu and are also practicing law. Wow. But I mean, yeah. you're, you're talking literally a handful of attorneys out of a population of? Of maybe um, 10,000 or oh, less, oh, yes, okay. from so, yeah, Kushai. It's, it's a, it's a, the ratio is so radically different from what it is in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But all that, again, that speaks to this need for sort of this bootstrapping process to bring more students on in. So what, what is it that you think can be done? What is it should be done to, to sort of foster the, a, a, a legal workforce, as it were? So I'll, put, I'll, I'll make my comments to what I wished were there okay. when I was searching. Sure. Um, it would be nice to have a list of options to uh, prepare for the law school admission test, because you can't get into law school without that. Mm -hmm. So if we have some notes or a, a book that is a booklet for every aspiring law student to go through, so step one is a law school admission test. If you wish to prepare yourself, these are all the vendors that provide such uh, options. And then the next thing is taking the LSAT. Mm -hmm. So LSAT is the law school yeah. admission test, which is not administered. It's what I was told was they, FSM can administer it. However, there is a really um, a, a good amount of fee that you have to pay for mm -hmm. them to administer it. So when I did mines, I had to take my personal leave to fly to Illinois, Champaign, Illinois, <laughs> to sit for a prep course for one month. And then immediately after that course, I sat for the LSAT. Mm -hmm. So. Like, that distance may not be necessary had there been information available for me to read through, mm -hmm. but because those were what I could find at the moment, sure. uh, my, my options were limited because I was working and I was doing it out of my own time, so mm -hmm. I couldn't exceed one month. Mm -hmm. And one month is what I, I could have come to UH, because they offer it, but it's a program for three months. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't, UH was already out of the picture, but these are options that we can have in a binder or something, so that they have a list of choices that they can 
choose from. Right. And then after that, you take the LSAT, you go back and you wait. And then you choose your law school. Mm -hmm. But if you have a roadmap, I think it would not, it's already, it's already scary for someone sure. to consider a, a small, a, a, an islander yeah. from a very tiny island to consider going to law school. So that's already scary enough. Sure. But then when you keep going, you know, jumping through all these oops, maybe you're gonna get tired yeah. And, yeah. and just not have enough energy to go to law school. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, those are what I thought, like basic foundation um, information that would really help a student. Right, and, and in this day and age, particularly, that should be, that information should be available, right? It should be easy to sort of gather it and put it all in some place on some website, as you say, in handouts, you could, you could uh, spread around the school so that high school yes. students would know, mm -hmm. hey, this is an option. I could actually go and do this if I wanted. And kids at the, at the uh, local college there, because uh, we've got a college of Micronesia branch yes. on Coach Rye, right? Yeah. Again, they, they should be sort of loaded up and ready to support students, right? So yeah. they, could, they could give some, yeah, because you were doing this all essentially without a roadmap, it sounds like. And that, that's making it, making it doubly hard on yourself. Yes, and uh, I've made notes um, along the way mm -hmm. so that I can work with whatever department, Department of Justice, Department, uh, maybe COM, FSM, and also the courts. Yeah. to make sure that these information are, since they're still fresh in my head, yeah. it's good to have them available. Yeah. And then we're just also on the side, ready and willing to help uh, other students. Absolutely, well this, this sounds like something you can, you can contribute to, the, to furthering you know, this aspect of your dream. And yes. it's, it's make it easier and more supportive uh, as an atmosphere for others to do. This is, this is really great. Uh, I, I so much appreciate you coming by here and, and telling us about this. This is a whole social issue that we didn't know about, the, the various issues you've had to confront, being uh, given the sort of traditional gender-based differences, you've had to deal with that, the, the distance, the isolation, yeah, uh, the lack of roadmap. So it's fascinating to hear this, and I, I'm so I'm proud of you for having done that, and, and yay on your parents, too, for supporting you in it. Uh, maybe we'll get you back here at some other point. We can, we can go into this in more depth, but uh, right now we've run out of time. Okay. Thank you so much, Shanti. It's been a pleasure having you here. Oh, thank you. Yes, indeed. And we'll see you on the next uh, episode of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Until then.